Thanks for attending. I met some of you earlier when we were chatting. Uh, and I got a gauge of where folks are coming in from. Let me understand who, who's an, I call him Michael Gerber, if you've ever read Michael Gerber's stuff. He calls them entrepreneurial dreamers. Who's in the idea stage? Thinking about it, maybe, maybe I will, maybe I won't start a business, but I've always had ideas. Okay. And a couple of you already have businesses. Who are, who are those? Are, okay, uh, older than, less than a year? Uh, more, than, more than a year, two years, three years? But yeah, you're, 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 you're double dipping though. You've got several things that you've had. So how long did you have your business? Uh, I started my first in 95. In 95 as well, okay, very good. Out from Sycamore area. Is that where you had your business as well? Was it? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. So this is your time, not my time. It's not for me to tell you about me or um, what I've done. Uh, I usually share what I've done because I, uh, I find that the audience, that helps prompt questions, helps draw uh, some conversation by uh, something triggering, saying, oh, you've done that or, or you've had this experience and I'm running into that or I think that's something that I'll do. So that's really, I'm like your reference person here. I'm not, I never say I'm an expert. Um, I bring perspective and experience, just like all of you, right? Everybody here has perspective and experience and hopefully in our conversation, chime in and if we're on a topic that you've run into and experienced, you share the word. What is there a bird in here or something? What is that? <laughs> oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> I hear this chirping. Uh, that's funny. So, and I do have notes because I'm running two businesses and I don't speak all the time. So, but I want to make sure that I, I get all my main points. Uh, let me share with you my background, as I mentioned, so that you've got a sense for that. So, as Michelle was saying, in 2000, or excuse me, in 1995, I had the idea to start a business on my own. Prior to that, and this was right before I turned about 30, so I'm, I'm sharing a lot here. Um, prior to that, like all the way to back in the high school, I had ideas. Ideas, crazy, goofy ideas, always had ideas on how to start a business. Whether it was cutting grass or, um, you know, whatever it would have been, I just felt like that's... That was what I wanted to do, is I wanted to have something, run something, create something, and do it on my own. It took me a long time to get to that point where I started my business. Now, some might say 30 is not that old, uh, but it was, a, it was agonizing for me because it would seem like continually, and my wife was, I drove my wife crazy because I was sketching out notes and goofy ideas and never able to act on them. In the book, that's one of the primary things I wanted to address. Why can some people act on an idea, have an idea, and act on it and make that business happen, while others seem to perpetually spin in ideaism and never seem to take action? So we can touch on that tonight, but I also do address it in the book. It's something that I call the entrepreneurial formula. It's a mouthful. And it's actually made up of two components. The formula is, it starts with the idea, uh, and the idea is an acronym, actually. The, the publisher failed to, to, to dot my idea. The, the creative powers wouldn't do it and make it an acronym, but it's an acronym. It, the I in idea stands for innovation, which is the basis, which is the nucleus of your business, being an entrepreneur. The D stands for desire, the E stands for effort, Desire and effort are what you need to propel yourself through the startup phase. It's the most difficult, physically, mentally challenging portion. Anybody of you who has started a business, 
it's hard and it requires desire and effort and that's the passion that you hear about. That's the only thing that sustains you because otherwise you'd be nuts trying to take as long as it takes sometimes to launch a business. And finally, A stands for abilities. Your abilities, your talents are brought to the table to manifest that business. Now that portion is linked with what I call, like I said, the entrepreneurial formula, which I won't touch on now, and then something called the risk box. So look for that in the, in the book. So uh, I got off topic already, which I tend to do. Uh, so I started TRC. Uh, the company name was TRC, Technology Resource Center. Oddly enough, I met, is it Mike? Yeah, M talking with Mike, Mike says, hey, we've got a commonality in a past coworker of yours. And it turns out a guy that used to work for me is, is a neighbor, was it again? Yeah, so that's kind of neat. But, uh, so I had this idea while working at a company to start what is called TRC, Technology Resource Center. And it was a, software, hardware, and reseller that sold into the higher education market. In 1995, the internet really didn't exist, if, if you can go back with me. Uh, so technology was really on the cusp, was particularly software. Software applications being used in the educational setting was just coming around. Things like Math Blaster and Reading Blaster, these kid edutainment titles were prevalent in the K-12 market. And I was working for a company that sold into K through 12. And I said, well, why don't we take this model and just apply it into higher education? And long story short, the, the powers that be didn't want to do that. And I saw that as my entrepreneurial moment. That was my idea, taking that business model into this new market. And uh, nine months of building it in a basement later, uh, we um, had our first sales, revenue came in. And shortly thereafter, we moved into office space and things took off. TRC uh, grew rapidly. We made the Inc. 500 list two years in a row. We uh, became the largest academic reseller. We jockeyed, depend on the quarter, between first, second, and third place for uh, Microsoft, Adobe, Symantec, all your top line publishers. Uh, we were selling their, their lines and such. And then eventually, in 2006, we morphed into really kind of a different, really an enterprise software management company, which I'll, I can explain. We built some intellectual property that, that really boosted the value of TRC. We grew to about a $40 million company, and the buyer, it was CDW who bought us, uh, at the time was something like a $9 billion company, you know, big for, you know, that was our competitor and they were huge. And, um, you know, they weren't interested in our revenue. They did that revenue in a day. Um, what they were interested in was the intellectual property that we built and how it addressed customer needs. And that's really a central theme of what I want to talk about tonight. So I sold at CDW in 2006, stayed on for a few years, which brought me to 2009. Uh, that's when I had the idea for this book. I didn't have the intentions of being an author, but reflecting that experience of having the idea and exiting, thus the title, uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> <laughs> um, I had this book in my head and I was traveling a lot and I was writing it out on the plane and then finally I got to a point where I said, <clears throat> I've got a Word document that's this big and jumbled and I either got to hit delete and move on with my life or I got to write this thing and get it done. So I took, I quit, left CDW, took a year to write it, and really it's for existing entrepreneurs, people who are just starting out, and uh, hopefully you can take pieces of it away that's going to help you in your own particular journey. So once I left and I had the book written, I was kind of, um, there were some personal things. We had a family illness that really kind of sidetracked my whole direction with the book, and I was kind of lost. I'm like, what do I do now? At the same time, the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem was really starting to develop in Chicago. Anybody here of 1871? Okay, big, hugely successful incubator in Chicago, really started by J.B. Pritzker in a, in a small circle of leaders in Chicago. 
that um, had the idea for it, and now Howard Tolman, who's a phenomenal entrepreneur in his own, it, both, they're brothers. His br Howard's brother, uh, Glenn Tolman, I think is his first name, started Allscripts, the healthcare company. So these are two very, very talented individuals. And so now he's running 1871. But regardless, I was doing speaking and getting involved with different events uh, in the city. I uh, became a mentor for Founder Institute, which we've got a, uh, a candidate right here. Are you accepted in? Yeah, I'm Fantastic. Working. So we're going to be working together uh, as a mentor. And as a mentor, I help, I meet with entrepreneurs, hear parts of their business ideas and, and give them advice and guidance. Um, I started something called High Growth Illinois. Uh, it was an SBA funded, grant funded program that had advisors like myself uh, that did mentoring and advising with existing entrepreneurs. And uh, I had the opportunity to meet probably about 80 different individuals and in their businesses. And again, the reason I'm sharing this with you is between Founder Institute and, and the, the idea stage folks that I meet there and High Growth Illinois in my own experience, I've met hundreds of entrepreneurs at different stages. And, I, and everything that they come to me for like I gain as well, because I'm learning from them and their experience and what they're going through. So uh, hopefully we can draw on that. Uh, I was an 1871 member, so I spent a lot of time down at, at the um, startup facility. And I've also pitched, so with my companies, I've pitched to investors. I've been on stage at, uh, oh, what the heck's the name of it? Technori, if you've heard of Technori, I've done the Technori. Very, oh, man, that was stressful. Five minutes, you gotta crank out this, this pitch. And it is really, really hard. Um, we, tr we went through the process to get into uh, Techstars, which is a, a very prominent um, accelerator program in Chicago. So again, if any of you are thinking of these types of things, I've done it uh, to, to either success or no success. <laughs> we didn't get into Techstars, but I've gone through the process. And we can help with that. Um, so today, you know, we're going to talk about the process of starting a company and becoming an entrepreneur. Some of you already are. I think this will still be relevant. I'll t we're going to focus on the idea and the startup pieces of the, of the puzzle. The running phase, the book is broken up into idea, startup, running, and exit. The running is like management consulting, right? I'm not going to tell you how to do balance sheets or operational processes. And some of you are not, I mean, it's very distant, right? Um, this is going to focus really on the entrepreneurial process. So as the sign-ups here, here says, you know, right way, wrong way. And I think there's a lot of pressure on entrepreneurs to do things the right way. There's a right way to start a business. And I don't think there is because making mistakes along the way is not what you want to do, but it's kind of part of the batch. It just kind of happens along with the process and you'll discover that you learn from those mistakes. So you shouldn't be afraid about making mistakes. In fact, being an entrepreneur has always been kind of, I did a lot of research for the book. You know, there's this connotation or picture painted that entrepreneurs are these risk takers and um, gamblers of sorts. And they're really not, the smart ones at least. They're really not. They take very calculated um, decisions, you could call them risks, but decisions that are based on validated learning. And that's a central theme that we're going to talk about. So um, when I got started, and even long before, say that, bootstrapping was really the way that you heard about businesses being started. You don't really hear the term bootstrapping anymore. It's all, anybody want to throw out the term that you hear nowadays? Growth hacking, yeah, I, I wasn't thinking about that, but that's, that's another one. Um, lean startup, right? That's, that's the buzzword. And uh, I'm an adopter, but I also, I'm gonna share some thoughts about how to not be so crazy focused on being lean, so to speak. Um, the thing about bootstrapping is it was really a monetary focus. It, it was like, I, I don't have enough money. I'm funding this myself with what I have, so I'm, do, I'm, I'm doing this on the cheap. Um, 
And it was, it was that kind of focus. What bootstrapping lacked was a process. What lean startup brings to the table is a process. And by having a process, a process can be repeatable and scalable. And so the big attraction now, um, which I think is great, because re I've read the book, I've gone to some, some workshops, is that by having a process to follow at startup and in running, your, running a company, even if it's th a 30-year-old company, following this lean methodology, this process, is spot on. It's, it's absolutely spot on, it, and it, it can save a lot of headaches, time, money, and so forth. Um, all right. I just don't want to miss anything here. So, the fog. So becoming, um, becoming an entrepreneur is a bit like this picture. The difference between an entrepreneur and a business owner is that a business owner is either established and has a, a, a business that's already been running. Um, local businesses like a hardware store, or a coffee shop, and so forth, they can follow existing business models to launch their business. An entrepreneur, and it's, the, the term gets misused, quite honestly, an entrepreneur goes into the unknown. They're creating something that's never been created before. They're either serving a new market, creating a new product. Um, would Matt, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it's a small group. Yeah. Would you mind showing your little device? Sure. It's a little advertising for one. <laughs> but, but Matt's created a device for swimmers that um, has never been created before, right? And so his journey is how do I find customers? How do I find a market? Is there a market? Do, does anybody want to buy this thing? You don't know because there's no history. You're, you're going into something completely new, which is, let's say, the excitement of it. Um, this is a quote I have in the book. I love it. The entrepreneurial process is similar to the classic hero's odyssey, where the hero or the entrepreneur embarks on a quest that requires separation or departure from the familiar world. And there's a couple key terms in here. Oops. Separation or departure from the familiar world, which I have highlighted. Um, separation or departure, you must leave what you're used to to become an entrepreneur. Your routine, your paycheck, your benefits, your hours, your family time, the way you look at money completely changes and the way you look at the world completely changes. And if you haven't done it, you don't know until you've done it. Everything changes and they say entrepreneurs can't work in a corporate environment, you can't go back, it, it, it's really hard. It's not to knock a corporate environment. It's once you've been on the other side, it's really hard to go back. Um, and there is no work-life balance. Let's get that out of the way right off the bat. <laughs> it's, it's all consuming, if you, especially in startup and running phase. Um, oh, I left off the, the other part in terms of the familiar world. Um, as I said earlier, you're going into the unknown because you're going to create a new world for yourself in this process. So that quote is really, really spot on. It's, it's pretty neat. So first of all, understand what an entrepreneur is. We started to talk about a difference between a business owner and an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur creates something never seen before, no blueprint to follow. Uh, the core of an entrepreneur is their idea. Okay, the core, like I said in the book, the I stands for innovation. That's the starting point. It's the beginning of the idea. That idea is the nucleus. That's the, the point of differentiation. Okay, and that point of innovation uh, is, is why you're different, right? Otherwise, you're just another business that's just copying what somebody else has done. Um, The E's job, uh, the E's, I always call entrepreneurs the E's. The entrepreneur's job is to assemble the required resources to make that idea a reality. And it's not to make it a, you know, a, a over the fence smashing success. When you're an entrepreneur, your goal is survival. Like when you're at this idea stage, 
your goal shouldn't be, I want to have this big office building, I want to have all these employees. You're thinking way too far in advance. You just want to think towards survival. Can I get enough revenue in to pay the bills and then start to grow that and, be, and, and grow a scalable business? Um, and so the entrepreneur doesn't have to be the master, the jack of all, uh, of all knowledge and so forth. Their role and the understanding of this is to gather the resources, whether they're people, whether it's money, uh, whether it's desks, equipment, what have you, and, um, and bringing that to the table. So where do entrepreneurs come from? And I, love, I just came up with this quote. I'm excited to share it with you. So as we say, ideas are, are, are the central theme, right? So like with, with yours, <laughs> is your idea going to work? Um, does it solve a problem for a specific customer? And I'm in your way, sorry. Are you speculating what the market wants? Or do you really know? And do you want to build this product and then see if customers will come? Well, that's a challenge. And when people are thinking of ideas, like when I was having all those years of trying to think of how can I start a business, how can I be an entrepreneur, and I was struggling, I was coming up with ideas of stuff that I honestly, they were probably good ideas, but I didn't know the industry, I didn't know the market. Like that device, I asked you, how do you know how to build that? Well, he's, he used to work at Motorola. So he's, he's got an engineering degree, he's got an understanding of how to make these things. I could have come up with that idea, but if I don't have that background, it's gonna be pretty tough. So the quote I came up with when I was writing this was, don't try to build a better mousetrap if you don't know how to make mousetraps to begin with. Does that make sense? Um, when I started TRC, it was a mail order business, so a four color catalog that we mailed out to the market and um, had inbound sales either through phone or fa yeah, yeah, fax back in the day. And if I didn't work at this company prior that did that same thing, uh, I never would have known how to do it. So there's two types of entrepreneurs. There's replicative and innovative. The vast majority of entrepreneurs, 90 plus percent, are replicative. They copy an existing business model and they take it into a different market or customer base or what have you. And that's what I did. I went, nobody was in higher ed. I went into higher ed with an existing business model and process. <clears throat> I think I had crazy ideas of like, you know, automatic toilet seats and stuff, and I mean, how am I gonna make an automatic toilet seat? I don't know. I just know how to sit on it, right? <laughs> so, anyways, so that, that's my phrase. Don't try to build a better mousetrap if you don't know how to know how to make mousetraps. So, all this comes back to process that I was discussing. And um, we know that bootstrapping is not a process, so what process do you follow? The lean process methodology focuses on the scientific method. Which, is, which the steps are laid out here. I tell you what, this has been, this was such an eye opener. So I've got two businesses now. Um, one is called Snagpad. And I don't think, see how I get off topic? I don't even think I told you about this. I, I interrupted myself. So uh, in 2012, I invested in a company that came to High Growth Illinois. I liked the technology, I liked the data play that they had, and um, I originally invested in them. And subsequently they then asked me to, to lead the company based on my background, and I was happy to do that because I wasn't doing anything else at the time. And what I liked about Snagpad was the idea. The idea was great. And I am, one thing I learned in this process, I am a god-awful investor. I'm a terrible investor. I bought the idea, signed the check, and then learned a whole lot of shit along the way that caused me about two years of development and so forth. So, founded by a, a, a professor who's been in human resource management his higher career, he created this platform that assists job seekers in finding a job 
as well as it's a two-sided model. It uh, is a case management tool for counselors and professionals who help job seekers. Well, what we didn't have at the very beginning was what problem are we solving? This technology is really cool. It, it captures job opportunities on this pad, <coughs> all the data behind it in terms of who the employers are, um, the movement of the card. So we're capturing labor data that's never been captured before. Um, I can think of all these markets that are interested in this, but as we get into this and we're developing, because all we're focused on is developing, which is a problem, we're not necessarily solving somebody's problem. And I kept going back to the co-founder saying, so let's, let's identify who's our target market. And it kept bouncing between, are we serving the professionals in a B2B market, or are we serving the job seekers in a B2C market? And the ping pong ball kept bouncing back and forth. And since we couldn't answer that, we couldn't answer whose problem we were ultimately solving. So we spent, so what we did with a, like a lot of startups is when they can't figure something out or they don't get traction, they just keep developing more stuff. <laughs> and, and this perpetual motion just keeps happening and it's, it's horrible. It costs money, it costs time, and this is the way to solve it. Um, you come up, before you do any coding, you follow this process, the scientific method. I'm going to go into the, what they call the feedback loop in a second. Um, scientific research, I just want to read this because I want to read it right. Scientific researchers propose hypotheses that are explanations of phenomena and design experimental studies to test these hypotheses via predictions which can be derived from them. So that's a mouthful. So basically what that's saying and what the lean process method, methodology is is let's come up with a hypothesis about the problem we're trying to solve. Let's, let's have a solution and say, our solution is X, okay? We're predicting what the outcome of this problem is gonna be. And before we build it and get all excited and invest in it, <laughs> let's run some experiments. Let's go out to our target customers and just give them something, whether it's a sketch on a piece of paper, if it's a mock-up, if it's a prototype made out of cardboard, the quality doesn't necessarily matter. It's getting in front of those customers and experimenting and validating, you know, are they, is our market coming back and saying, yes, you've got the right idea? Taking that to swimmers, and, and chime in if you've done this, you know, going to the sw two swimmers and saying, here's this device that clocks your time, that clocks your time. Is that attractive to you? Yeah. Then you take, the, so now you've, you've reached a conclusion and now you take the next step forward. So if this device were this big, would you wear it? <laughs> if it was, you know, you, you get the point. And that's how you follow this methodology. So the chief, chief characteristic which distinguishes the scientific method from others of acquiring knowledge is that it seeks to let reality speak for itself. Entrepreneurs have the propensity to guess and say, I've got this idea and I really think the market's gonna like it and therefore I'm gonna move, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in, I'm gonna go for it, right? Well, that's dangerous and you don't need to do that, right? There's always this rush of we gotta get to market fast. My founders, with both companies now, uh, Snagpad and the second one, Zigavite, um, both web-based platforms, the founders were like, we gotta get to market. Someone's gonna steal the idea. Well, it's been two years, nobody's stealing the idea yet, <laughs> right? And if they do, they can be the first, the, the leading adopters, and we can learn from them and tweak it and make a better mousetrap, so to speak. Um, but using the scientific method, it's all about validating and, and, and getting valid information. Um, empirical and measurable uh, evidence is what we're looking for, okay? And what you want to create is this feedback loop where you take your idea, you, val you bring it to, you build a prototype of sorts. Again, and the, the whole objective here is not, it's minimal money spending if no money spending at all, okay, at this point. Um, 
And this is a great lesson, especially for, as you go through Founder Institute, there's tremendous pressure, um, and also in these accelerators, to get to coding, right? Now, if you don't have the resources to code, if you gotta pay for a developer, back it up. Sketch it on paper. Anything that you wanna develop on in a, uh, in a computer program, a web application, you can, sh you can do mock-ups in Excel and PowerPoint and say, how does that look? Do you, would you be interested in that? Well, yeah, I would if you'd move that over here. That's the process you've got to take through this feedback loop. Um, this phrase I copied down, I liked. Startups exist not to make stuff, make money, or serve customers. I said startups exist not to do this. They exist to learn how to build a sustainable business. And this learning can be validated scientifically by running experiments that allow us to teach each element of our, of our vision. And so this feedback loop is basically you build, um, you measure the results, uh, which are um, establishing learning milestones, or excuse me, actionable metrics. So ahead of time, you're determining what metrics you want to uh, learn from this process. You get the data back and you establish your learning milestones. And then at this point, you're making decisions. Are we on the right track or are we not on the right track? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. How important is it to have, uh, I mean, for people to be paid for these provisions? I always say, I mean, I, somebody can tell me they like it for free, but until they pay for it, it seems like that's something. That's your, right, like that's your validation that if, um, do you build it and then wait for revenue to come in or immediately seek revenue? Is that what you're saying? Well, I guess even in you know, iterations, I mm -hmm. think it's some low fidelity prototypes, you know, just you know, big things that you know, strap on your head. Obviously, someone wouldn't pay for it, but it validated the value proposition, but it didn't validate that I could sell a product. I'm going to answer your question in the next slide. Okay. Because there's, to, to go off of that question, and it's a great question, there's a huge propensity and drive around the lean startup methodology to get this crumply bag out to market and, and see if somebody will buy it. Buy that piece of crap. It's cr we know it's crappy, but we just want to see if you're going to buy it. Well, I'll argue that that's not necessarily the right approach. Okay? You can, first I'll, I'll, I'll start with Reed's statement. This is a great, great s phrase, right? If you're, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late, which is a bit about what you're saying, right? The, the, the concept is get it out there, get people testing and get them trying it, okay? You have to balance that. There's, there's a huge legal issue, which you probably are very familiar with right now, and that is protecting the right people. I don't know if you've gone through with patents or trade uh, patents or copyrights, NDAs, but I think that's a huge part of developing a product. You can't just take something that you have an idea, build a prototype, and go around and show them it. You can't do that today because it'll be stolen on. And so the process requires that when you go show this to somebody, your attorney will tell you that NDAs are the only thing that has teeth. If I give you an NDA, you sign that NDA, and then I show you my product, and then you mass produce that product, I'm rich. <laughs> right, right, right. But and if you don't know that, you just gave it away. And, and, and so the topic of patenting, when to patent, when, when to go public, they're all individual um, judgment calls. Mm -hmm. You talk to any lawyer, they're gonna say, batten down the hatches for as oh, long as you can. <laughs> right, right. And, and I'll say it, it's really situational. In the case of um, Zigavite, my latest company, it's a sales engagement tool. And it's a web platform, easily copied, easily copied, in fact, uh, well, anyways, um, 
but we need to learn. First of all, my co-founder said, we got to get this patented. When, in the little bit I learned, and, and please, I am, not, I am not giving out legal advice. Um, ours was not worth patenting. We had a pro, Zigavite is a process. It's not necessarily intellectual property. Now you can patent a process, certainly. But um, there was no underlying technology, algorithms per se, that really gave it that secret sauce. It's a process flow, is really all it is. And, and somebody could copy it with slight variations. And patents are very rigid in the sense that um, they're, they're difficult to write. Once you write the blueprint, people then have a blueprint to say, OK, uh, here's the path, A, B, C, D. If I go A, B, D, E, F, G, A, B, you know, I can work around the patent. So there's pros and cons to each. If we go back to Reed's statement of get it out the door, no matter kind of how it looks, if you're embarrassed, to Howard Tolman. Howard Tolman just put this statement out uh, yesterday. And um, yesterday or today, I think I added this slide today. And he says, uh, the entire lean startup movement not only misleads and misdirects people into building mediocre products and potential services, it also much more of a curse than a cure. Uh, quick and dirty out the door sucks as a strategy for successful startups. So there's a balance between these two worlds, is what I'm saying to you. Um, the point about getting money and paying for it, in my web applications, I've been very sensitive of bringing it to market and bringing on beta users because the beta users I've found who have been interested in our concept of Zigavite have said, oh, this is great, I want to use it, use it. But if I, and I don't know these individuals, um, if they use it and it breaks, it doesn't work, we're, pro we're providing them a tool that is reaching out to their prospects and leads. If I damage that, they're not going to give me the time of day, right? Um, so I need to make sure it works pretty well, right? I need a pretty baked product. Again, I think it's situational um, on, on where you're at and also who you're sharing it with. One of my beta users is, a, is now going to, is a former employee that I had and give a great relationship with him. He can call me up and say the damn thing doesn't work, it sucks, I hate it, and he'll still be there, <laughs> right? Um, some of these other prospects that we have as beta customers um, that are large companies, I can't, I can't do that with. So the lean startup methodology, Howard hits it right on the head here. You, you can't take it literally, you, you've got to really understand your audience and where your product's at before you, you take that approach. So that feedback loop we talked about, gaining knowledge and information, brings you to a pivot point. Uh, in the lean methodology. And that is, do you continue with the course that you're, do, you're going or do you pivot? Now, pivots vary in degrees to where uh, we, we've seen stories of companies that started out selling oranges and now they're making cars, right? I mean, vastly different. I would say that though, in those situations, that founder was leading with an idea and passion without doing this validation of if, if there was a market and if they were solving a problem, they led with their heart, so to speak, with building the technology. It seemed cool, and so they built it, and nobody came. Um, most pivots in a successful company are, are slight variations, and they can happen over time. So with TRC, <clears throat> never saw this coming, but this was, the, the best lesson I learned, and I'm probably not telling you anything new, but gosh darn it, this is probably the most important point of, of anything. We were running, I ran TRC for 10 years. It was growing great doing what we were doing um, year over year, but it was still a very highly competitive space. We were selling commoditized products. My Adobe Photoshop or Microsoft Office was just like the next reseller. In this case, you know, resellers that were billion dollar competitors. So my margins were very, very thin. <clears throat> so we had to differentiate. We had to innovate. Even as a, um, 
you know, a fast growing successful company. And so what we did is we started listening to our customers. And this is part of your journey too, is you start out with that idea and you want to get, when I talk about that feedback loop and that validation, you want to continually get in front of customers, whether they're paying or not, you want to get your product in front of customers um, and get their feedback as to what, your, what they think of your product. And oftentimes it's not so much the surface level of the product, it's, I'll say backdoor stuff. So again, in the case of TRC, what we did is we sold software and hardware. We advertised that we sold 50,000 products. Everything from USB drives to projectors to cables to laptops to software. That was a lot of stuff. And guess what? As we grew and those SKUs grew, it was really hard to train staff to be experts on everything. And so the quickest way to make a sale was to do what? Just lower your price. You know, I don't know shit about that laptop, but if you want to buy it, you know, I'll ma match my competitor or I'll lower the price. Well, that's not a really solid business model. So that, and that hurt cash flow. So overnight, and then we're getting feedback from our customers. They were gravitating for, through license, software licensing through us. Um, one thing we did really, really well, because it was my background, is was enterprise software licensing, because it can be very complicated. There's different levels and programs and so forth for institutional customers. So that's what we focused on, and that's what we naturally started to know best, and the market picked up on that. And so my sales reps and my customer service reps kept bringing back information to me about problems about fulfillment, actually getting the product to the customer and um, compliancy aspects. I'm the IT director for Northwestern University. And nor guess what? Higher education is very decentralized. So there's like 500 buyers in the campus. But as IT director, I'm the guy responsible for that license. So if those 500 people load the software incorrectly, you know, they put on more computers than they have licenses, it's a $10,000 fine per application. And guess whose ass is on the line? So do I really care if I pay 50 cents more or a dollar more for that license? No, I'm gonna to go to TRC because they built a web-based application, a cloud-based application that managed software fulfillment, compliancy, procurement, and administration. All of our competitors were selling Microsoft Office for 9.95. We were selling administration, compliancy, fulfillment, procurement. And guess what? We could raise our prices because of that. And the only way we, and that was a huge pivot. Once we learned that, literally overnight, we said, we're cutting off the rest of the SKUs. We're never selling hardware again. All we're selling is enterprise software licensing. And that helped us niche, that helped us focus. Our sales reps got better. Um, <clears throat> and ultimately, that's why we got acquired, because of that piece of intellectual property because we were kicking our competitors' butts and their bureaucratic systems couldn't build and couldn't replicate such a system uh, as ours. And, um, and this is not me patting myself on the back, this is just emphasizing the point that we listen to our customers. And then we went out and we visit with our customers and we said, well, how can we make this better? And what, we never asked them about what, you know, what's your next round of Microsoft purchasing we asked them what were the problems about distributing the CDs around the campus and so forth. And we, we created a cloud-based system that downloaded software. We got software publishers' rights uh, to do so. Nobody was doing these types of things. So that's where you know, the innovation came in and where we pivoted our business. But it wasn't, in that sense, like a negative pivot. It was based on this customer feedback. Um, I probably spent too much time on that. So fundamental activity of a startup, turn ideas into products, measure how customers respond, learn whether to pivot or persevere, um, and all successful startup processes should be geared to accelerating, accelerating that feedback loop um, from, from your customers. All right, growth hypothesis. Um, as you create your business, you also need to have a theory about how you're going to grow. These are four common methods, uh, word of mouth, 
uh, side effects of just using the product, advertising it, and repeated purchase or use by users. So there's, what do we got on time? I don't want to go. 7.12. 7.12, okay. Um, good. So a sticky engine. And understand, why do you want to understand how you're going to grow? Because it really becomes fundamental in how you set up your business. When um, I started TRC, my growth engine was volume. I just wanted to grow the top line. I wasn't concerned about the bottom line, I wanted to grow the top line. When I got involved with Snagpad, I wanted to grow users. I wanted many, many users because the, the user's data is what was going to make the, the application rich. Okay? With Zigavite, I want to grow by specific customers who expand. Uh, we sell to sales reps. So I want one sales rep to use in an organization, and I want that to spread to 10 to 20 to 50 to so forth. So with a sticky engine, you're developing a product or service that has high customer retention. This is your, your measurement. You know, do I have uh, a product where people kind of come and go, or does it cause high customer retention? Something like um, Salesforce, a CRM application, where the users are really dependent because their business processes are using that tool, and therefore that re customer retention rate is high. What you measure, to determine how well you're doing is the, is the churn rate. So the percentage of customers who stop using the product, and you measure this, you know, uh, especially I'm referring mostly to web apps in this case. Um, you know, if, if I see that uh, my, my percentage of customers who stop using the product after three months, six months, nine months, a year, whatever that measurement is, is too high, then, you know, I gotta get out of my office and talk to customers and find out why are you abandoning my product. Um, and the positive side is looking at the rate of compound growth is, is the measurement that you're using um, to judge your successfulness. In a viral engine, you know, growth is, is the side effect of customer use. And you measure that by something called the viral coefficient. And this is a measurement of how many new customers will use the product based on each new customer that signs up. So basically, I sign up a customer, and he tells two friends, and he tells two friends, and he tells two friends. That's the viral engine. And the viral coefficient is saying, if I add one user, that's going to equal five additional, if my growth engine is viral. Are you, are you talking about new processes versus, to me, this is the basis of a prospectus. When you say basis of a prospectus, what do you mean by that? It's something that I put together that not only tells me what my future plan for my company is, but it's also a tool that I can use to venture capital. So I'll say that the purpose of why we're doing this is not so much for an outside audience, it's for, it's for you and your development. Because particularly when, you, when, <clears throat> when you're building a web-based business, you're modeling that application. It could be a free app, like freemium, in other words, to get users going on it. You might have ancillary revenue streams, so you're not really dependent on them paying you for that application, maybe it's advertising or whatever, that's going to generate revenue. So you have different purposes as to how you're going to bring users on and retain those users. Knowing that up front in your, creates your business model. And, and then creating that business model is also going to affect your development. So you want to know, how am I going to grow? You're going to make a hypothesis that I think this thing's going to grow virally. Um, or via advertising. The way I'm going to grow it is I'm going to, I'm going to pay Google for SEO traffic and a percentage of that SEO traffic is going to become users. Are you, are you putting together dollar values, one, three, five year? What do you think you're going to for do in the next five years? For startups, I, so I, I, I've been at this since 1995. 
on my own. And in startup phase, perspective, like balance, you know, forecasting is crap. <laughs> yeah, for me, I found it a, a, a kind of a futile exercise. You do it, even investors nowadays could care less when they see that five year, <laughs> you know, they know it's, it's artificial, right? And, and it's very false. So um, I emphasize more, what am I, what am I gonna do in, a, in 90 days, in six months, in a year? That's really for startup phase and in early running. Because the, the difference you'll see in the book, the, the difference between startup and running phase is, is monumental. Startup, everything is driven towards demand generation. You're trying to, to create demand, right, in startup. Gain awareness, people come to buy my product, you're, you're, you're advertising, you're trying to get people aware. And then magically, you change to running, which is when you're in demand fulfillment. You're still doing demand generation exercises, but what happens is now, instead of you outbound calling so much, people are calling you. People are going to your website, they're buying your product, word of mouth is happening, and so now demand fulfillment is kicking in. And that's when your needle shifts. That's when you know you're in the running phase. When you've got cus customers just show up and buy your product and you don't know where they came from. Okay, yeah. So I have a question. So I think that's where a lot of startups get into trouble um, because you get to that phase and you, what you think is your critical mass is just an illusion, right? Just, and then you kind of jump the gun and you hire people and you make, that's where I, I've done this. I made mistakes hiring too fast. Yeah. How do you, it's like a balancing act. How do you know when you're making that phase from startup to Established. That's when budgeting comes in <laughs> and well, forecasting. Well, you're not sleeping anymore, and nobody else working for you is sleeping either. It's time to somebody. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I don't know if, if, if I can give you a, uh, an articulate blueprint to follow, but my own was it was cash flow driven. Um, and I'm generally, I would say, a, a conservative person to fa at fault. I'm probably really too cheap. And so with TRC, it was self-funded and we, we had sales coming in, so now we had some revenue and we were able to put some revenue in the bank, so the, the bank account was getting a little bit bigger, but as you're growing, all that money's accounted for. It's going into something the next 30 days, 60 days, or what have you. But you can start to budget and say, all right, for the last 30 days, last 60 days, last 90 days, uh, I've had either consistent sales, I've had consistent growth, and I'm gonna hedge. Maybe it's time to hire somebody. And, um, and that's what you're doing. You're hedging that that growth is gonna continue and that obviously you can match salary with what you got in the bank or what you see coming in. Um, and yeah, some, uh, some folks, the folks that typically do it, the only ones who, who typically do it to a fault are the ones that have money through, say, investors. If you're doing it yourself, you only got that much money. Could be a lot, could be a little, but um, the ones who generally are fault get lulled into these false cues and they say, well, I got, I got enough in the bank and we want to grow fast, so... Let's do this. I'm, I'm not a big flag waver of let's grow fast. You know, there, there's, a, there's too much emphasis on exploding growth. And you know, if you do things right, then that'll happen. But when you start to force it, I think that's when you make mistakes. Because then you're like, oh, we're on top of the world and, and we got some VC money, so let's just pour it in. Um, money can really be the root of, of all evil because it can, it, when I, I, had, I had some money to invest in Snagpad and it was easy. I wrote a check for six figures, that's a lot of money. And you know, the, the money made it easy for me to make dumb mistakes. <laughs> and, and then I kind of learned back to my um, bootstrap days. Brings us to funding. Um, funding, whenever I would meet with entrepreneurs, 
they would typically, s I, I, would, I would always say, what's your business, you know, in 30 seconds, and what are your top three problems? And then I learned by saying, what are your top three problems, and one of them can't be money. <laughs> because money was um, typically, yeah, money is always going to be a problem, and it was a crutch. We said, well, we can't do this because we don't have money. We can't do this because we don't have money. Get that off the table. Now, what are your three core problems? Because as an entrepreneur, right, you have to find the resources to make this thing sustainable. And if you don't have money, then you got to find a way to make it happen without money. I needed a trade show booth when I had TRC. And uh, I found that Sears was giving away their trade show booth. And I said, I'll take it. So a friend of a friend, he said, sure, they'll show up. These Atlas vans pulled up behind my building and started unloading like these King Kong sized crates. I didn't even know what the hell I was getting. And uh, as it happened, we took the pieces that we wanted and we eBayed the rest. We actually made money off of it. Um, same thing with furniture. I mean, there's pictures of, I needed tables and chairs. Well, where did I get them? I got them out of a dumpster. Then I graduated and I got them through resale shops. I mean, I always paid, these chairs I would pay 25 bucks, 30 bucks for. Never pay more. I got arrested for taking them out of the dumpster. <laughs> Excellent, that's what I love. <laughs> you even made the paper. No, oh, that's, that's where you were at. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> when, we, when we got, when we had money, we didn't have to do paupers. I mean, I'm, embar I'm not embarrassed to tell you. When I go to trade shows, I would take pens at the vendor's booths because the hell if I was going to spend money on pens at our business. Sounds cheap, but hey, that's what you got to do. Um, once we graduated to uh, you know, getting more money, we needed office panels and nice work surfaces. We bought them secondhand from a bank that was um, getting rid of their old furniture, like steel case stuff. So I mean, you do, I don't know how I got on that topic, but I, I love being stingy and um, actually, stingy is the, the wrong word. Frugal. frugal. Yeah, frugal. So, okay, funding. This is a hot topic, typically. Um, the big questions in this open conversation, should you get funding? Can you get funding? How to get funding? So if we start at the top, let me dispel all funding rumors. If you do not have traction, don't go for funding. It's a waste of time. It's a complete waste of time. If you've got a great idea and the next best thing, go get users, go get revenue. Ideally, go get both. You'll just waste your time. I've gone before uh, Pritzker's group, uh, several investors throughout Chicago, and I learned this lesson the hard way because I thought I had the next best thing. I thought I was a big shot. I wrote the book. I'm, I'm investing in this company, Snagpad, and it's really cool. And, and and it's a data play. How many users do you have? <laughs> How much revenue do you have? Well, talk to us in six months. So, um, contain yourself. Build your business without feeling you have to get this money. If you're truly passionate about building this business, get tractions with users and revenue however you do it. If you, if you think you're going to be dependent on getting funding, um, you're going to be sorely mistaken. And this goes even down to the angel level. Okay? In the past, angels would buy ideas. ideas. Okay? Now the only person you can sell ideas to is friends, families, and fools. <laughs> right? So... Is there a threshold on the funding amount? There's, kind of for. there's a, there's a, there's a somewhat of a formula, but it's, there's never a golden rule. Basically, um, if you're early stage and you're getting traction with some users and you, and, and you can, you can show some sort of forecast. I've got this group interested. Um, these, these, this amount of beta users. Whatever you can show that you're gaining validation from the marketplace and you can then sell that, the entrepreneur's role is selling to everybody. 
You're selling employees, you're selling suppliers, you're selling to investors, you're selling to your family. This is gonna take off, trust me. <laughs> Ride the insanity with me. Um, but typically early stage is gonna be anywhere from 50,000 to half a million. And that could come from angel groups. You're typically not going to get venture capitalists at early stage with minimal traction. Um, e even with traction, the angels come in first, they'll do lead rounds, and then they'll, then VCs will put in minor amount, they'll dip their toe in, right? Um, funding could go, they, they say, sometimes you'll say, well, I want two million. Anywhere from like, a, I've heard this, anywhere from like a million to five million is like a dead zone. And, and you're like, what do you mean by a dead zone? Well, it's too big for angels in some cases. Angels of like Hyde Park Angels is really up the ante in terms of what they fund. But it tends to be too big for angels and too small for VCs. To fund a company, it requires due diligence and a lot of legal expense. And so they say, well, if we're going to put money in, let's, let's bet a big horse and let's go beyond that five minutes. It's not to to put any illusion that that funding amount does not happen. It does, okay? Just know that, that if you're asking for two million, that there's this expense involved and time involved that you need to sell. You need to sell why it's worth their attention, okay? Yeah? My, my experience with venture capital is that it takes me the same amount of time to manage a million dollars versus ten million dollars. I'd rather do a ten million dollar project. Right. So they want you to come big when you come to them. Right. Exactly. And they're they're very much sheep. And they want control of interest. Yeah. So they always want control of interest. Th then this is a great conversation. So, and a lot of people don't know this. When you're going for funding, guess who pays for the legal expenses? Guess who pays for the VC's legal expenses? <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> that really sucks. Um, yeah. So the same is true starting with your own money if you're um, doing a business that's brick and mortar, where by nature, like a roller rink or something, you have to have a building to even get started. So how can we have a client? If you're, if you're doing a brick and mortar, then you need to have assets. Your own assets. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, I right, right. Because. So, willing to provide him so much, but he needs venture capital, the bank told me, and he has his own money, he has seven-eighths of the money, they want him to go out to venture capital and get one less life. So let's, let's dissect those terms. Okay. First of all, it sounds like we're talking about a business owner, not an entrepreneur. He is a business owner, the new project is an entrepreneurship, something that very few people do that there's a high need for. Okay, fair enough. So, um, and that's why I said if it was a business owner wanting to do a roller rink or whatever I, I thought I heard, I said that, but yeah, then any, no, no angel, no VC is going to invest in a business per se because it's, it's not that innovative. It's very, um, it can be copied. You know, where's the explosive growth? How do I exit at 10 times a multiple? I can't do it with this, this type of business. That's why they're not going to attract VC. So when, when I hear the word, you know, go get some VC money and a bank's involved, th that's typically like oil and yeah. water. Yeah. 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 yeah, it sounds like he's getting led in a false direction. Right, but he, he definitely has his own money. So the established mm -hmm. business that he owns is 50 years old. He got from his father. So he's using that plus his own money as collateral, but he, he's telling him he needs X, Y, Z more. I'm like, really? Yeah. And it is innovative, it is new. I don't know about 10 times the money and how much time, not two years, but certainly five to 10 years. Yeah, so the more likely route is here, and that's tough to do. I mean, I don't, I've never done it. I don't think I'd want to do it. Um, but if you're really passionate and, and you, you have a vision of where your business is going to go and how your investors can get out, and you have to look at friends and family as investors. You, you can't just say, hey, thank, you're, you're, you're helping me out. You, you don't want that because you run the danger of jeopardizing that relationship. 
you truly want to give them their 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 earnings, what they can what they can cash out and what what you're selling them on. Um, but it it seems like that's a, a more I don't know enough details, really, okay. but um, but what investors look for is a business that's going to grow rapidly, and it doesn't have to grow balance sheet rapidly. I mean, how long did Amazon not make money, right? But it had users and it had consistent and high revenue growth. You know, so they're looking for these things that they can flip. It's flip or flop, like that house show, right? I mean, they're not in it for the passion of the business. They're in it because that asset can, can be flipped. And so um, my company, Technology Resource Center, was not a venture capital business because, in its onset because it was a reseller. We didn't do anything special. Sure, we had nice growth, but... Um, Anybody who was going to buy us at that stage was going to buy off of our, account, off our balance sheet. What, what VCs are going to be interested in is what that um, intrinsic value, value of the company is. The intellectual property, right? What, um, and, and, and who is going to be interested in that? So my two companies today, which is what I keep holding on for, Snagpad and Zigavite. Uh, Zigavite, I see a market with someone like... Um, Groupon and the other, those types of targets. And um, Snagpad, we, we've, we've got several companies lined up where we're a solution that can help their business and so we see an exit with that. So part of the purpose of the idea of, of my book, From Idea to Exit, is you as an entrepreneur, when you have this idea, you should have the long range vision of how you're going to exit. Okay, and it's not to sell out, so to speak. It kind of is, but it's not with that greedy intent. When I started my uh, TRC, I told I sold everybody who came in, my equity partners and so forth, that we were going to sell to a Fortune 100. I didn't know when, I didn't know how, I didn't know who. But at my idea stage, I had that vision that that's where it was going to go. I envisioned that we were going to sell the higher ed market. Um, that was the explosive market. Millions of, of new students coming in, so a recurring population. And someone who, who wants to put credit cards in those students' hands, people who want to put cell phones in those student hands, would be interested in us because we were selling to them. As it turns out, I sold to another reseller. <laughs> but um, anyways. How to get funding. Let's say you, you believe you are ready to get funding. Uh, the effort involved and the time involved is monumental. Um, and you have to compete with what investors are used to seeing, and it's kind of this packaged pitch process. Um, and getting down your elevator pitch, and these accelerators manufacture it very, very well. Founder Institute is going to kick your butt on getting your elevator pitch down and, and your pitch. And it's great because you need to do that. You can get into a very informal setting where if, if investors do like what you're doing, you sit at a, you're not up presenting and, and doing the wild PowerPoint deck. You can actually have a civilized conversation and hash things out um, if they get the idea of your concept and so forth. But um, packaging your company, getting that pitch tech down, understanding the triggers that investors are looking for are all these ingredients that you have got to have nailed. And like I said, this takes a lot of effort. It's a lot of distraction from your business. If you don't need to go this way, don't go this way. If you're not ready to go this way, don't go this way. Don't think you need funding because it's the cure-all because you're give, your funding is very expensive. You're selling your equity. Your equity is huge. It means it's crap right now, but it's obviously your intent and your effort is to grow it. Um, a Silicon Valley quote that I love is, equity is like shit. If you just let it pile up, it just smells bad. But if you spread it around, it grows wonderful things. So 
with TRC, I didn't have money. I needed resources. I need people. I needed talent. We created a four-color catalog. I'm not a graphic designer. I needed a graphic designer. Um, I gave equity to a graphic designer to, to make my catalog. I gave equity to a gal to run the business out of her house and manage vendor, our, 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 our vendor relationships and so forth. I spread around my equity with key people. If you spread your equity to investors, you're on a fast path to dilution because the first round often is not enough because what happens? You spend it. It's easy to spend. It's in the bank. Um, the story back in the day was investors pushed you to spend that money because they wanted to give you more, because they took more. Um, and you don't know anything in this process. You don't know diddly squat. And they will walk over you and take, take full advantage of you. Um, and, and, and that's with good investors. They will write documents that um, if you're not solidly prepared with a lawyer that knows what's going on, you can get hosed really, really quick. And that's just what they do. Jeff, yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Uh, so um, Matt and I were talking about this before. One of the challenges is when you try to build a team. How do you find that person that doesn't just want a job, but how do you get them to buy into your vision? Yeah. Because you mentioned giving an equity to that person, but how do you do that? How do you determine yeah. how much to give them? And so I'm repeating the question for our camera folks, but the, the folks in TV land. So how do you bring on partners um, either with equity, predominantly with equity, how do you bring on partners, employees that uh, you're going to trust are going to stay in the game, right? It's very, very difficult, and I've made the mistakes, okay? Um, I was very lucky with TRC that I knew people. I, I had a whole talk at Founder Institute about um, partners. I'm the type of guy I've learned through trial and error. I'm a solo. I'm a lone wolf. And if I was going to do it all over again tomorrow, um, I'll say this. I'm a lone wolf in that I w I'm the vast majority. At TRC, I gave, my, I gave little pieces of equity to my partner, to my um, to people I brought on really as employees. Um, with Snagpad and Zigavite, I've given substantial amounts, um, one of which, for Zigabyte, I went out and found a president to run the company. I'm funding it, but I went out and found a president, um, and he's, he's at a substantial percentage. He's at, he's at an arm wrestling percentage where we can go toe to toe. You know, I'm not the 800 pound gorilla. I don't like that um, because I think most of us sitting at this table are probably very um, focused, to, we're type A, we know what we want, we know what direction we want to go into, and right or wrong sometimes, you know, we're a bull in a china shop. And when you've got somebody who's like that, riding with you, that can, if you don't get the right person, it'd be difficult. The lesson, this is a long way of saying this, the lesson I learned is you got to get to know the people. I rushed into relationships, um, I, I invested with people and I didn't know those people that well. Knock on wood, it turned out the founder's great. The other co-founder, we had to buy out because he was an asshole. He didn't want to work. And, and, and I have only myself to blame because I was anxious to get in the game and do it. Turned out, this guy's listed as co-founder and he's not doing jack. So well, I got a day job. I got to work that job because that's and then maybe after hours I can do this. I'm like, what the hell is this? We can't do this. Finally, you know, it got to, and then it would cause a lot of pain and agony. We said we got it, and then, and then the the another mistake, fully vesting. Okay, we can we can go into all sorts of topics. So um, we're good friends. We're going, we got this idea. Let's, you know, you 50-50. And yeah, we're vet. Hell yeah, we're vested. This is our idea. We're working on it. No, 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 no. You as founder, vest yourself. Vest everybody in it. Vest them for four years, five years. I don't care how long it is. Typical, it's like two or three or something like that. I'd go four or five. 
you, you like my idea, you're in on it? Great, you're in on it for the next five years. Because guess what? It, it doesn't matter if it's five years, 10 years, or 20 years. If someone wants to buy you tomorrow, you just got a clause that accelerates your vesting 100% if someone's gonna buy you. So everybody's happy, right? In the meantime, we gotta build this company. So your equity doesn't mean squat, right? Whether it's vested or not vested. So just show up to work. And if you don't, then you're hanging on to that equity, right? You go to an investor, with the 50-50, we're, we're, we're both 100% invested. So investor, take that and he'll say, here's a vesting schedule. You want my money? You're all vested. So that's the way it goes anyways. Whether you get money, if you get money, you're going to be vested. If you're not getting money, you're even more at risk because if you give somebody a percentage and then they walk because they're a doofus or whatever, and now they got a percentage, holy crap. It's like a ball and chain around your leg for the rest of your life until you shake them or you got to buy them out. Can you clarify that? So you'd say the people that come in as simply as investors, that they would be trusted, and the founding team, the people who started with the idea and everything, are they invested on the same schedule? Or the, the, invest, the investors, will, let's say you're three co-founders and you come and I'm the investor so the deal is <clears throat> great uh, I'm gonna buy 30 percent which is the target they're typically gonna hit you up for I'm gonna get 30 percent equity for giving you X amount of dollars and we don't have to get into what how many dollars that equates because it's all different based on the valuation of the company but I'm getting 30 percent now you are all are on a um, four-year vesting schedule, maybe you negotiate that, you get three years, two years, whatever, but you're all vested. Me, on the other hand, I'm giving you a hundred thousand, a million dollars, and I'm also going to ask, build into the contract that every year it's going to get eight percent interest. That when it comes time for me to cash out, I'm going to get my money plus my multiple plus my eight percent on my money. So, and then let's say we're growing and everything's great and we got to get another round. You're going to get a new vesting schedule. Is it a cliff vesting or a schedule graduate? All depends. Everything's negotiable. Now, here's, here's the other side of it. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, you know, being vested diluting with, with equity with investors. If you're getting around two, that means good things are happening. And as the phrase is, you know, if I own 100% of nothing, how much is that worth? Nothing. <laughs> if I own 50% of something that w maybe was valued at a million when I started and now it's five million, well, there you go. So. You're only taking more money if the valuation of the company is going up, and the valuation of the company is going up because good things are happening, right? And, and again, it's, it's going back to that slide. Why do you think of your growth engine? You're, when you're thinking of your ideas, you should know right now if your idea it needs to be funded or, or is going to be funded or not. It shouldn't be something you discover. You should be researching this and understanding this now. And by virtue of that, then, that's going to dictate how you're going to grow your business and how you're going to manage your business, okay? And how you're going to go to market. Um, if you think you're going to get funded, then that means you, you're going to go to VCs and angels. I mean, let's dispel this. You're not going to the bank for a loan. No, nobody, <laughs> unless you want to and put your house up and so forth, but okay, yeah. Um, but for this, typically that's not going to happen. So if you are going VC, you've heard what, what the deal is. They're only going to invest in you if this is this high growth potential company. If you all agree that that's where you're going, then, then they're in it to win it. And that's what you're going to do, right? Um, I, I have a funding path for Zigavite. Um, I think it's a fundable company. I still think Snagpad's a fundable company. Um, 
because I see that I have the vision of where I think those two companies can exit. Not just for me, but for the investors and the market potential that they have. Is that it? Thank you. Yeah. I talk a lot. So we can finish with questions and I'll hang around, but I want to wrap up to be polite for everybody else. This is just a phrase that I, I've had on my desk forever. If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. Successful or not successful, um, you, you could be on the top of the world, top of your game. If you keep doing what you're doing, it's the status quo. And you'll get, but you could always do better. Um, and that I think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave this up because I like my little acronym. But being an entrepreneur is like this, in startup. <laughs> you've got 30 days in a month, let's say. In this case, there's 31 days in a month. 30 of these days suck. <laughs> They kick your butt. You wonder, why the hell am I doing this? Um, day in and day out, it's such a drag. And then finally on that 31st day, something happens. <laughs> and it keeps you, keeps you coming back for another 30 days. So with that, I'll, well, I'll end with the side. I'll say thank you, and I'll stick around for questions. Okay. Yeah.